So inshallah tonight we're going to uh, talk about the exegesis of surah number 101, Al-Qari'ah. <clears throat> so if you have a Mus'haf uh, handy, have it on your phone, uh, or an actual Mus'haf, you get to follow along, inshallah ta'ala. Surah 101, which is called Al-Qari'ah. Bismillah. So uh, with this surah, there's no difference about the name of the surah. Quite often, and Imam Suyuti has a section in this, the Itqan, uh, about the surahs having different names. This one is unanimous amongst the ulama that there's one name, it is called Al-Qari'ah. We'll talk about what this name means, inshallah ta'ala. The dominant opinion is that this was the 30th surah revealed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Obviously a Meccan surah, early Meccan surah. It followed uh, surah al-Quraysh uh, and was followed by surah Yom al-Qiyamah, which is uh, surah number 106 and 75 respectively. There is a difference of opinion about the number of verses as well. So there's three different centers, really. The ulama of Medina said it's 10 verses long. The ulama of Kufa said it's 11 verses long. And the ulama of Sham said it's 8 verses long. That's just the numbering of the verses. The content of the surah is exactly the same. Okay? There's no missing ayat or something like that. Okay? It's not like what we have with the New Testament, for example. It's just a numbering. Different centers of Ulum, they have uh, numbered the surah differently. In the Uthmani Codex, <clears throat> it's 11 verses. So we follow the, uh, the Ahl al-Kufa in this regard. The surah is talking about something that is incumbent upon every Muslim to believe, uh, which is the Yom al-Qiyamah, the Day of Judgment. One of the names of this Judgment Day is called Al-Qari'ah. So this is something that is transmitted to us. This is called sam'iyat. Sam'iyat are things that we have to believe in as Muslims, also known as ghaybat. Uh, things that we would not have known had it not been for revelation. <clears throat> so revelation, naql or tanzil, this is what informs us of the yawm al-qiyamah. Okay? And it's incumbent upon us to believe in it. Um, and other things as well, we believe in the sirat, crossing the sirat, we believe in adab al-qabr, there's punishment in the grave, in the hisab, in the hashar, all of these types of things. These are under the category of sam'iyat. So when we follow or when we uh, study aqidah, it's tripartite. We study theology, and we study prophetology, and then we study these supra-rational transmissions. These sam'iyat, these things that are mentioned in the Quran and Hadith, that are dalil qat'i. So we believe in Yawm al-Qiyamah, we believe in Malaika, we have to believe in these things. If we don't believe in these things, then we're not Muslim. We have to believe in these things. So we begin with the first verse, inshallah ta'ala, after we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-Qari'ah. So what is Al-Qari'ah? So this is from the uh, root Qara'ah. And qara'a means to strike or to beat something, or to knock something. So you say qara'a asnanahu, right? He gnashes his teeth. Or yuqra'u al-abdu bil-asa, according to texts of grammar, that the slave was beat with a stick. So that sound, right? It's a sound that is loud, and it's a sound that is disturbing, right? This is called qara'a. Right? You use the verb qara'a, something that's loud and disturbing. So you can imagine somebody being whipped with a, with a whip or a stick or something, a psh, psh, like that. Psh. It's very disturbing. That's called qara'a. Or like a car crash, right? Sometimes, you know, sitting in your backyard, you hear screeching of tires, and then you hear the impact. And you know it's coming, but it's still scary, because you don't know the extent of the damage. Or qara'a al-bab, qara'a al-bab. Right? There's daq al-bab, which means to knock on the door. Muqara al-bab means to knock at the door in the middle of the night. Right? Imagine you're sleeping on the couch. They say you're watching something on TV. Not a good idea. Right? Anyway, it's a waste of time. But you dozed off on the couch, and then 3 o'clock in the morning, somebody's knocking on your door like this. Right? This is called qara al-bab, because it's loud and it's disturbing. And you don't know why it's happening. Right? 
So in Arabic, according to Arabic rhetoricians, the people of Baraha, there's two types of speech. We talked about this. There's majazi and haqiqi. Majazi means figurative speech. Majaz, majaz, figurative. And then there's haqiqi, which is literal. What is majaz? According to the people of grammar, the rhetoricians. To put an expression in a place where it doesn't belong, to produce some sort of an effect. So this is fi bab al When we study Arabic, there's sarf, there's nahu, there's morphology, there's grammar, that's the science of the language. And then there's something called balaha, which is the art of the language. One of my teachers explained it like this. Uh, if you want to become an architect, you have to study, obviously have a degree in architecture. right? You have to know how to build a building. But if you want to make a beautiful building, right, that's the art component or the art aspect. It's not just about building a building. It's about building a beautiful building. So there's a science aspect to the Arabic language morphology and grammar, and then there's an art aspect. And we'll see in this surah, it's very beautiful from a rhetorical standpoint. And there's subtleties in the surah that cannot be translated. It's impossible. So again, I highly encourage people to study a little bit, if you can, the Arabic language. We have to really push ourselves in order to taste some of these meanings of the Qur'an. <clears throat> so, Imam al-Baqilani, he actually said that there's no uh, majaz in the Quran. There is no figurative speech in the Quran, and Ibn Taymiyyah said that as well. And it's because, you know, they say that it's essentially a lie, right? Figurative speech is a lie. وَمَنْ أَسْتَقُوا مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا And who is truer in speech than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? For example, if I say, I'm so hungry, I can eat a horse right now, right? Is that really true? Can I actually eat a horse? Let's say I'm starving. I can never eat a horse, nor would I eat a horse, nor would I attempt to eat a horse. Right? It's just impossible. But am I lying? Can you say you're a liar? <laughs> Most people say no, that you're being hyperbolic. Right? You're trying to make a point by using hyperbole and exaggeration. Right? So technically, it's not a lie. So most ulama would say that there is majaz in the Qur'an, there is figurative speech in the Qur'an, as long as there's a dalil, as long as there's a dalil, wujud dalil, right? So, for example, if uh, somebody walks into the masjid, let's say Masrud walks into the masjid, and I say, Dakhala asadun al masjida, I say, a lion has entered the masjid, right? What am I saying? I'm saying someone who's tough, courageous, a shuja, right? That's what I mean, it's figurative. You can't say, oh, you're a lion, that's not a lion, that's an insan, you've insulted him, so on and so forth, right? No one would say that. So you know what I'm talking about. There's a delil. You know what I mean when I say that, right? So based on this, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses majaz, speech in the Quran, there's a delil. We know what he's uh, talking about based on our knowledge of balagha and the Arabic language. So with that said, what is Al-Qari'ah? Is it literal or is it majaz? Some translations will translate Al-Qari'ah as literal. What is Al-Qari'ah? This is called an active participle. Ism fa'il. Ism fa'il. Active participle. Right? How do we form an active participle in English? Let's say I have the verb to write and I want to make an active participle. What is the active participle? of the verb to write. How do you form it in English? In English? E-R, e very good. You put an E-R at the end, right? So writer, right? The one who is actively doing that verb, E-R. Writer, the runner, the painter, right? The prayer, no, you can't say that. Sometimes it doesn't work. You can't use an E-R. So sometimes it's difficult in English to form the active participle. English is a very difficult language, by the way. Right? There's so many exceptions, and it's an amalgamation of so many different languages. Right? So in Arabic, all you do is you put an alif on the first letter. So qari'a. Right? Qara'a, qari'a. But this is qari'a. There's a tamar buta at the end, which makes the, the noun feminine. So there's a rule in Arabic, a general rule. 
that you have the triliteral root, right? Fa'ala is triliteral root. If you put things at the beginning or end and extend the word, it adds tokid. It adds emphasis. The longer you make a word in Arabic, the more it's emphasized, the more uh, it's intensified. Okay? So al qari'ah is a feminine ism fa'il. It's feminine. The feminine gender here has tokid. It has emphasis. Okay? So, if we took this literally, haqiqi, it means the striker. Right? The striker. Or the beater. The, the knocker. And some translations in English, they translate it literally as the striker. But most of the ulama say that this is a calamity. It's more majaz in meaning. It's a calamity that hits you out of nowhere. A sudden catastrophe. So it's not literal. Imam Suyuti says in the Jalalain, Al Qiyamatu Lati Takra ul Qurub bi Ahwaliha. That the Qariya is the Qiyamah, the standing on the Day of Judgment, which Takra ul Qurub. It strikes the hearts. This is from Qara'a. It strikes the hearts with its terror. With its terror. So the heart is struck with terror. This is the meaning of Al-Qari'ah according to Imam Suyuti. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And obviously this is talking about the Yawm Al-Qiyamah in which Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الصَّاخَ Right? In Surah Al-Abasa. Or Surah Abasa. That uh, when the deafening noise, Sakha means something deafening. You remember we talked about last week the ring structure of some of the surahs of the Quran, right? The Kayasmus. So this is put in juxtaposition of the beginning of the Surah Abasa. What does the beginning of Surah Abasa say? Abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahu al-a'ma. Right? Uh, that he frowned and turned away when the blind man came. The Prophet Wasallam is giving da'wah, right, to the leaders of the Quraysh. And they're not really listening to him. They're kind of giving him a half hearing. And the Prophet ﷺ, he does not raise his voice. Even in the, in the marketplace, he doesn't raise his voice. Very soft-spoken, mild-mannered. So his gentle preaching here, at the beginning of the surah, is contrasted to a sakha at the end of the surah. That when the deafening noise comes, right? You know, sometimes a teacher is trying to teach, and he doesn't want to raise his voice, but people aren't listening, so he goes like this... And everyone suddenly, like, it just happened. Right? So if you're not going to listen to me speaking, then you're going to listen to this. Right? If you're not going to listen to the gentle preaching of the Prophet ﷺ, This is a day in which a person will flee from his brother, his parents, uh, his father and his mother, and his uh, spouse and his children, because this is the maqam of the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So there's different names for the Yawm Al-Qiyamah in the Qur'an. There's many different names. One of them is Al-Qari'ah. And according to Imam Suyuti, what does it mean? That it's called the striker. It means that this day, it strikes hawl, fear, terror, into the hearts of Bani Adam. So that's the first verse, Al-Qari'ah. And this is interesting. What kind of construction is this? Just one word, al-qari'ah, right? So, there's different opinions as to how this functions grammatically. One opinion is, because al-qari'ah tu, there's a dhamma here, a dhamma. And what, what, what does it mean if a singular noun in Arabic has a dhamma for people studying Arabic? What is this case ending? You know what case endings are? Is it marfur? Is it mansub? Is it makhful? Is it is marfur? Good. It's nominative. Nominative. Okay? I know some people are lost right now. But you really have to try to learn some Arabic. Because you, you miss so much if you don't know it. So marfur, that means that this is al-mubtada. This is called al-mubtada. This is the subject of a sentence. It's the first part of a nominal clause, jumlatul ismiyya, a sentence that doesn't have a fi'l, it's a verbless clause. But here's the thing, the jumlatul ismiyya has two parts to it. 
There's Mubtada, al Mubtada, which is the subject, and then there's the second part, which is called al Khabar. Right? Khabar. And without these two, you don't have a complete sentence. So al Qari'a is not a complete sentence. Okay? So how do we deal with it? It's like saying, as sayyaratu and then I stop. The car is, and then I stop. That's not a complete sentence. I need a khabar. As sayyaratu sari'atun. As sayyaratu jamila. I have to complete it with a khabar. Khabar means news, information, the predicate. Right? There needs to be a predicate. So, how do we deal with this? One opinion is that what happened here is called hadth mahbufa. That the khabar has been cut off by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't mention it. He doesn't mention it. Al qari'ah, and he is silent. He doesn't mention the khabar. The conceptual khabar is apocalypsed, mahbufa. This is called mahbufa. What's the point of doing that? To create tashwiq. Tashwiq means anticipation. Anticipation, right? Or to create hawl, terror. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's not giving you the khabar, He's just giving you al qari'a and letting your imagination run wild, right? Some of the ulama say the conceptual khabar is atiya or qariba. In other words, al qariyatu atiya, al qariyatu qariba. And this is based on tafsir bir riwayah. That if you look at other places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the sa'ata atiya. The sa'a, the hour, is coming. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah, He doesn't mention it. And to keep you listening, and to create that tashwiq, and to focus your attention on al muqtada al qari'a. That's one opinion. Another opinion is that the, the fi'l, the verb, is mahdufa. The verb has been cut off. What was the verb? لَتَأْتِيَنَّ الْقَارِيَةِ Or أَتَتْ الْقَارِيَةِ That the hour is coming. The qari'ah, the striker is coming. The striker is coming. The verb has been cut off in order again to create that focus on the word al-qari'ah and to create shawq, anticipation, longing in the heart of the listener. Okay? Another opinion, this is the opinion of Fakhruddin al-Razi in Tafsir al-Kabir, he says that the point of this is tahdir, tahdir, which is warning, warning. For example, if I say fire, fire, right, fire, right. So if I say that in Arabic, I can either say anaru or anara. Both of them are acceptable. You can either make it nominative or accusative. You can, in other words, you can make it marfur or mansub, right. So he's saying that this is saying. Something to the effect of beware of the striker. Beware of the striker. Right? The effect of this is tahdir, is for you to take caution of al qari'a. This is the opinion of Akhradin al Razi. And another opinion, Imam uh, Sha'rawi, very interesting. He says the first verse is al Mubtada, the second verse is the Khabar. What is the second verse? Mal qari'a. Al Qari'a, Mal Qari'a. So verse one is the Mubtada, the subject. Verse two is the Khabar, the predicate. But verse two is a question. It's a question. This Ma here is Istifhamiya, which means that it's interrogative. What does it mean, interrogative? Does anyone know what that means? Question. It means a question. What are the interrogative uh, nouns in English? What, who, what, when, where, why? Right? So this ma means what? Question mark. Because there's different types of ma in Arabic. There's ma, nafia, hijaziya, mosuliya. There's different types of ma. This ma is istifhamiya, meaning what is the qariya? So the ulama say, how can the khabar of a sentence be a question? Is that even proper Arabic? The khabar of a, of a sentence is a question? Imam Sha'rawi says, this is true, it is a question, but it also gives you khabar, it gives you information. What is the information that Mal Qari'a is giving you? 
What is the effect of that? Is that this qari'a is nothing like you can possibly imagine. This is the effect of making it into a question. So it is giving you information. It is a khabar. And it's telling you that what you think it is, al-qari'a, when the Arab hears that, he thinks of certain disasters that might have happened in the past. But then man qari'a, what is the, the qari'a? He's thinking, okay, that's not what I was thinking. It's something that I don't know what he's talking about right now. So he keeps listening. So even though it is a question, it's still considered to be a khabar. Allah ma'ala. This is one of the Am I confusing people here? al qari'a, man qari'a. The striker, what is the striker? The calamity, what is the calamity? Now, interestingly, uh, this beginning of this surah is used in one other surah. Because the next verse is, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَ What other surah begins like this, in the same words? The same wording, yes? The elephant. Yes. Uh, yes. No, not the elephant. Another, there's a pseudo-surah that's called Al-Fil that begins like this. Because Musaylama al kadab right, the false prophet, he was asked by the Bani Hanifa to produce a surah. So he said, Al-Fil, Mal-Fil, wa ma adraka Mal-Fil, antfahu tawil, wa dhaylahu qasir. This is what Musaylama said. Al-Haqqa. Al-Haqqa. Good. Al-Haqqa. So Musaylama just, he, he copied the Quran. He said, this is my surah. People laughed at him. <laughs> because the elephant, what is the elephant? What will explain to you the elephant? It has a long trunk, a short tail. This is a surah. So, al-haqqa, mal-haqqa, wa ma adraka mal-haqqa. Right? What's the next verse? Kathabat thamudu wa adu bil qari'ah. Right? So interestingly, there's a connection here between al-qari'ah, surah qari'ah, and surah al-haqqa. Very interesting. It begins the same way. The same wording. That's just an FYI for you. Little connections, little nuances in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions qari'a three times in three verses. What's the point of doing that? This is called ifhar fi maqami mudmar. Ifhar fi maqami mudmar. Proper nouns in the place of pronouns. Because He could have used pronouns. Al qari'a ma hiya wa ma adraka ma hiya. He could have said that. The qariya, what is it? What will explain to you what is it? But why? Al qariya, ma al qariya, wa ma adraka al qariya. Why mention it three times? For what? The reason is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again wants to emphasize the greatness of al qariya. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls something by its, its name rather than a pronoun, that means that thing is great. That thing is great. So we're trying to focus our attention. Al Qariya. And notice in verse 3, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَ And what will explain to you, or what will make you realize what is Al Qariya? And he uses ma here. And this ma is not the same type of ma we had before. The ma in the previous ayah is istifhamiyya. This is a relative ma. What will explain to you what is Al Qariya? And notice here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't say man. And who can explain to you? What is the difference between ma and man? What and who? In other words, there's nothing, whether it's human or otherwise, that can make you perceive or realize or actualize what is al qariya. So Allah did, did not say, wa man adraka al qariya. He said, wa ma adraka al qariya. What can possibly what thing, not just who, what can make you realize what is al qariya And notice here also in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uses the past tense adra. Adra is past tense. It's a causative verb. It's from the root of dara, which means to know or to understand. What's the point of using past tense? You'll notice this really interesting nuance that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we might have mentioned this last week, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about things in the Quran that relate to al-akhirah, the afterlife, he tends to use a past tense verb. A past tense verb. What's the point of doing that? According to the ulama, in a sense he's saying basically that that is a done deal. It's done. It's guaranteed. 
It's guaranteed to happen. That's the point of using a past tense verb for something in the future in al-akhirah. For example, if you tell me to go do something, the brother says, go get me a glass of water. I say, consider it done. Have I done it? I haven't done anything. I haven't gone out my chariot. But why would I say, consider it done? Because I want to reassure him that definitely it's going to happen. Right? But I may not do it. Because I'm a human being, I might break my leg on the way down or something. Maybe I'll ignore him. Maybe I was lying. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's going to do it. Right? He's the truest in speech. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Kawthar, Inna a'atayna kal kawthar. A'ata. A'atayna is past tense. Verily, we have already given you kawthar. Kawthar is nahrun fil jannah. Is a river in Jannah and other things as well. But there's a river in Jannah called Kawthar. Was the Prophet Sallam already given Kawthar? He's, he's living in Mecca at the time. In other words, consider it done. We've already given you kawthar. It's done. Kawthar. What does kawthar mean? Literally, it means khair kathir. It comes from kathir. Kawthar. This form is sigatul mubalagha. This is an intensive form. We've given, we've already given you manifest good things. So don't worry. It's already done. It's done. Right? Tabbat yada abi lahabin watab. Tabbat. Past tense. It's, he's done. He's not going to become Muslim. And all he had to do is say, I'm Muslim, become a munafiq. But he had such inan, such obstinacy, that he didn't even do that. Abu Lahab could have discredited the Quran if he wanted to. He could have done it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew he wouldn't. So in reality, he can't do that. Because tabbat is his past tense. His hands are already perished. It's a done deal. He's talking about something to happen in al-akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, innaka mayyitun. You are dead, and they're dead. You're dead. Consider yourself dead. Right? If you consider yourself dead, there's nothing really to be afraid of. Right? If you can, if you can conquer your fear of death, then, you know, giving a khutbah or something like that is not a really big deal. Right? Go helping people and sacrificing your wealth. Who cares? I'm already dead. So this is the trick of the samurai. The samurai, before they go into battle, convince themselves that I've already been killed. I'm already dead. So how would I fight? You're going to fight like you've never fought before. Right? It was very interesting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, quite often in the Quran, uh, when the hereafter is spoken of, he'll use the past tense to assert its certainty. Okay? Uh, that's why here he says وَمَا أَدْرَى كَمَا الْقَارِعَ Past tense. But in Surah Abasa, Abasa wa tawalla an ja'u al-a'ma وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَزَكَّى Now he uses a present tense. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ is present tense. Because what is he talking about? Something to happen in the dunya. Right? He frowned and turned away when the blind man came. But what will make you realize that perhaps he might become purified? He's talking about something that happened in the world. So the present tense is used. But in the past tense, something that's going to happen in the future, Allah uses the past tense. Uh, I mean, and, and for the akhirah, something that's going to happen in the distant future, or near future, relatively speaking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use the past tense. Right? This is a nuance in Arabic. So, al qariah Now, some of the ulama mentioned that al qariah could also be the striking of the, or the sounding of the trumpet for the third time. So they mentioned it's going to happen three times. The sur will be blown three times. Who's going to blow it? Who? Israfil. Israfil is an Arabicized form of Serafil. Serafil is an angel mentioned in the book of Enoch in the Jewish tradition. Serafil is an uh, archangel. Serafiel literally means they're made of light. And in that sense, they're burning. It's going to blow a sur. So the first blowing of the trumpet, according to the ulama, is described in the beginning of Surah Al-Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nas, ittaqu rabbakum. O people, fear your Lord. Inna zalzalat al-sa'ati shay'un adhim. The uh, quaking of the hour 
uh, is a great thing, a terrible thing. Adin, Shaywan, something that is Adin. Right? The ulama say this is the first blowing of the trumpet. That it strikes terror into the hearts of those who are on earth. Those inhabitants living on earth, the first blowing of the trumpet will strike terror into their hearts. The second and third uh, sounding of the trump or the trumpet is mentioned in the Quran in Surah number 79, verses 6 through 9. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yawma tarjufu rajifa tatba'uha ar-radifa qulubu yawma ibn wajifa absaruha khashia. He says uh, that the the, sh the shaker, the, the Quaker will quake. Not the Quaker as in the Christian guy. The Quaker is going to quake. This is called Arajifa. This is the name of the second blow of the trumpet. Arajifa. When this trumpet is blown, everything on earth is going to die. Everything is dead. Everything in, everything in creation is dead. Everything. Kullu man alayha fan wa yabqa wa jurabbik. Everything is annihilated except the countenance of your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is called ar rajifa And then this, the third and final is called ar rajifa ar rajifa And this radafa means to come after something. So the verse says, when the Quaker quakes, tatba'uha, following it is ar rajifa Following it, tatba'uha, ar-radifa, will be the third blowing of the trumpet. Uh, uh, what is the next word? Wajifa. Hearts on that day are uh, dumbstruck. Absaruha khashia. And glances are full of khushur. You know how like when we pray, we say, have khushur. What does khushur mean? Have humility in your prayer. When you pray, have humility, right? Don't move around. Someone who has humility, if you're, if you're sitting in front of a great man, you know, and people are sort of sitting there and they want to respect him, no sudden movements, they might confuse him. That's just a bashar. How are you going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? With khushur, right? That you're standing in front of him knowing or actualizing the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that your life is in his hands, so to speak. Right? This is called khushur. So, you may or may not have it in the dunya, but everyone's going to have it on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Because now things are apparent. Everything is uh, out in the open, right? People get out of their graves, they see all types of strange things. Uh, so, when they're standing on the, on the plane of the concourse, uh, their eyes are downcast. They have khushur. So this is verse 3. So basically translation, the calamity, what is the calamity, and what can perhaps, what can possibly explain to you what is the calamity? So it is a day in which human beings are going to be like scattered moths. 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 <laughs> Hard to pronounce. Sounds like a moth, right? Moths. Or butterflies. They use butterflies. Human beings are going to be like scattered bu butterflies. But moth is actually better. Right? Because moths are attracted to light. I don't know what butterflies are. I don't. So, this is interesting here. This yawma, this is called maf'ulun fihi, az-zamunun ladhi waqa'al fi'lu fihi. This is the time in which a action will happen. On yawma. What yawma is this? Yawm al-qiyama. So, al-radifa is another name for al-qari'ah, because it leads to this yawm. That's one opinion. Or al-qari'ah just simply means yawm al-qiyama, based on this ayah. So it says here, human beings will be kal farashil mabathud, ka, right? This ka is called kaf tashbih, the kaf of similitude. When you make a comparison, you use this kaf. Now, there's two ways to make a comparison. There's kaf tashbih, which really has the effect of a preposition, and then there's ka'anna. 
Ka'anna is from the akhawatu inna. It makes the next noun, the proceeding noun, will be mansub. It'll take a fatha. Ka and ka'anna. What is the difference between the two? There's a subtle difference the ulama mentioned. When you use ka and ka'anna, they both mean similar to, or like, or as. So the ulama say, ka is used for things less intense, less similar. Where ka'anna, it's more similar. So, there's nothing nearly like the likes of God. There's nothing remotely like the likes of God. Or like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the human being, they're like cattle, even worse. Right? Meaning that they're worse than cattle. This is when you use cat also. Uh, rather than ka'anna, that human beings are worse. They're not mere cattle, they're worse than cattle. Hence, bal adullu, because cattle are not mukalla, they're not taken into account for things. But ka'anna, ka'anna is used when you're going to make a more intense comparison, more similar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Saf, Inna Allah yuhibbu alladheena yuqatiluna fi sabilihi saffan ka'annahum bunyanu marsus. Allah loves those who fight in his cause, uh, in battle array, as if they are a single cemented structure. Right? So there's more emphasis here. To be very, very close-knit. A strong comparison using ka'anna. Or like the munafiqeen, in Surah Munafiqeen, or Surah Munafiqoon, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ka'annahum khushubun musannada. They are like propped up pieces of hollow timber. The munafiqun, that's what they're like. And it's a strong comparison. That they come into the masjid and they lean on the back of the masjid and they're hollow on the inside. A propped up piece of timber cannot stand by itself. It has to be propped up. And if you push it too hard, it's going to collapse. Because there's nothing on the inside. Right? So this subtle difference between ka and ka'anna. So, the state of human beings then, kal farashin mabathuth is going to be less than moths. Like moths, but less than moths. And annas, it says annas. This is all-encompassing. Because there's a definite article on nas. Annas, alif lam, right? It's called ta'rif, the definite article, which is uh, denoting istighraqiyya, meaning all, all of humanity is going to be like this. But less than, worse than moths. Because again, moths are not mukallaf. There's no taklif established on moths. What is taklif? Responsibility. Right? In other words, a moth or an animal, like a cat, my dog, if I had a dog, you used to have a dog, my goldfish, he's not going to be standing on the day of judgment and his deeds are not going to be presented. Why? There's no taklif. There's no responsibility for an animal to become a Muslim, so to speak, like we are. Because nature is in a state of fitrah. It's already going according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds to be pleasing. But human beings have limited volition. They have a choice. There's a little bit of choice. That's why there's going to be a reckoning. This is called kasab. Kasab. So mabathuth, this is the adjective. It's a passive participle. Mabathuth, it comes from batha, which means to scatter or to disperse. <coughs> so, unlike birds, if you watch birds, for example, when they fly away, they tend to kind of go in the same direction, right? But moths, they just, they go crazy. They don't, they don't know what they're doing, right? They go every which way. And they're attracted to something that is light, but in reality is going to harm them, right? So, this is indicative of the state of total chaos on the Yom Al Qiyamah, that when people come out of their graves, because most people deny the Yom Al Qiyamah, they're going to be resurrected, walking on the earth that's been transformed in their same bodies. The body is physically uh, reconstructed, although it's now a pneumatic body. It's more uh, a spiritually oriented body rather than a physically oriented body. But it's the same body reconstructed, even down to the fingertips, according to the Quran. But people won't know what's going on. There's going to be utter chaos. What's going on? What am I doing here? What date is it? Where's my mother? Where's my son? 
Where's my Lamborghini? Where's my iPhone? I can't live without it. Have you seen my iPhone? Oh, what's this guy doing over here with his tongue hanging out? Why is this guy crucified? Why is this guy drowning in sweat? What's going on? What's, what is this? People had no idea. There are some people, they live and die. They've never even heard of the Yom Kiyam. Imagine the chaos. It's utter chaos. Utter chaos on the Yom Kiyam. Worse than moths that are spread about, flying everywhere. There's an interesting hadith in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu he says, I am like, I am to you as a man who is standing in front of a fire and is shooing away moths, farash, and you are the moths. Okay? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's comparing himself to someone who's shooing away us from a light that's going to kill us, the fire. And he's trying to shoo us away. Right? There's an interesting story told by Ibn Sa'ad. Uh, of the conversion of Khalid ibn Sa'id, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Khalid ibn Sa'id, a great Sahabi, very early in the Meccan period. And Khalid ibn Sa'id, he had a dream, uh, and this is before the Prophet وسلم, proclaimed publicly that he's Rasulullah. Right? So most of the Quraysh did not know about his Risala at this point. Uh, so Khalid had a dream, and he didn't know what to do with it. So he went to Abu Bakr as Siddiq who actually was a great dream interpreter in the Jahani period, right? So he had that reputation. So Khalid comes to him and he says to him, you know, I had this dream last night uh, that um, I'm standing at the edge of a lake of fire. And my father, Saeed, he's in the fire and he's grabbing me and he's trying to pull me in with him. He's pulling me in, and I'm trying to resist, I'm fighting him off, and then he's pulling me, I'm trying to resist, and I'm just about to fall, and then as I'm just about to fall into the fire, and somebody comes from behind me and grabs me like this, and pulls me out. And he said, I turned around, and it's your friend, uh, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa He said, what does that mean? And Abu Bakr told him, uh, you know, Abshir, he's the messenger of God. Right? Be of good cheer, he's the messenger of God. And this is how... Uh, he found out that the Prophet وسلم, is the Messenger of God, and this led to his conversion, obviously. So the Prophet وسلم, is a means, a sabab of our salvation <clears throat> from the fire, and this, of course, also is indicative of the shafa'ah in the maqam of Mahmud that is given to him exclusively on the Yom al Qiyamah. <clears throat> and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the mountains, Jibal is plural of Jabal, and the mountains will be ka like Ihnil Manfush. What is Al Ihn? This is wool. It's wool, but it's a certain type of wool. It's multicolored or textured wool. Okay? Um, wool that has different alwan, multicolored wool. And manfush. Again, passive participle, ism maf'ul, means something fluffed up, or carded, or combed. So, the point of this, according to the ulama, is that there's going to be a reversal of roles, or a restoration of values. What you think is a mountain in the dunya, this is a jabal, this is definitely true. These things are going to be like carded wool. A mountain, you can just blow it and it's gone. Right? There's some people who say that in the past, the Roman Empire will never die. The sun will never set on the British Empire. It's a mountain. Right? Those things that you thought in the dunya were forever and were stable and would never perish, they're going to be like carded wool. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Right. So this analogy it adds again to the hawl, the terror of the Yom Al-Qiyamah. Because they were solid on the earth. But things that you deem to be fragile on the earth, these things were solid. Like for example, when Ibn Mas'ud was climbing a palm tree and his calf was exposed and the Sahaba started laughing at his calf because it was so skinny, they're laughing at his calf. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, this calf is the size of Jabal Uhud on the Yom al Qiyamah, because he knows the real size of that calf, right? Not what you perceive it to be. Jabal Uhud in the dunya is huge. The calf is small. 
But Jabal Uhud on the Yom Al Qiyamah is like carded wool, and that calf is as if it's Jabal Uhud. Right? Or like the Hadith al Bitaqa, famous Hadith, uh, which may have some weakness, but the Hadith basically says a man uh, on the Yom Al Qiyamah, uh, he's going to see all of his bad deeds written on 99 scrolls. And they stretch as far as his eye can see. And they're placed on one side of the mizan, which is a scale. And one card is put on the other side of the scale, which is called al bitaka. And what, which is heavier? In the dunya we weigh, in the dunya we, the way that scales in the dunya are calibrated, which is heavier? The 99 scrolls obviously is much heavier. But the scrolls will rise and the card will fall. Why? Because written on the card is La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And Allah tells the man, nothing is weightier than my name. Right? So this is the means of his salvation. Um, so things that we deem to be nothing in the dunya, these things are really weighty. For example, a brother might say, why should I lower my gaze? Who cares? How does that help me at all? Right? Who cares about that? But, again, that one little act is going to have weight on the Yom al Because scales on the Day of Judgment are calibrated differently than scales in the dunya. In the dunya, it's weights, it's pounds, and you know, kilograms, and things like that, grams. But on that day, it's ikhlas, and a'mal, and niyat, it's sincerity, and good deeds, and its intentions, these things have weight on that day, right? So just because you don't perceive it in a dunya we sense doesn't mean it's not true. And this is a difficult issue for men to lower their gaze because men are very visual. Remember Imam Shafi'i, Shakautu ila waqi'in su'a hibdi fa'arshadani ila tarq al-ma'asi. Imam, Imam uh, Shafi'i, in a beautiful poem, he said that he complained to his teacher because he was losing his memory, and his teacher said, lower your gaze, and he remembered, oh yeah, I looked at that woman's ankle. He looked at a woman's ankle, and he began to feel his memory slipping. One of my teachers said that he went online for about 15 minutes, and he couldn't remember his, his awrah. He just started planking out, looking at things that are halal on the internet, never mind haram things. So it's a great ni'mah, what do we look at? It's a great ni'mah that we remember our names, that Allah has given at least some retention to us. The Prophet ﷺ said that, paraphrasing the hadith, that you know when a man looks at, like a woman is beautiful, uh, the first look is allowed, because that's from the fitrah. And the, the fitrah, it recognizes beauty, and it likes beauty, it loves beauty. Right? Uh, so that's not counted against him. But then, if he keeps looking, then the nafs gets involved. The nafs is tra translated soul, but it's not really the ruh. This is the lower self, the mortal self. It's called the nafs. Right? What in Greek is called the psuche, not the pneuma. Right? The psuche is the lower self, the mortal self. And that becomes involved. And then, he said, وسلم, if he continues to look, then iman is drawn from his eyeballs. As long as he's looking, his iman is taken out of his eyeballs. So that's why people who can't control their gazes, Allah says in the Quran, tell the believing men and women, lower their gaze. People who can't lower their gazes, they suddenly have no interest in prayer and they don't feel it, I don't feel it anymore. You know, I'm just you know going through a phase, I guess. What are you looking at all day? I don't know. I'm just, you know, watching my computer all day and flipping channels and God knows what kind of channels are on TV these days million channels, and the parents say, oh, it's a parental lock on it. Your kid is a genius. Believe me, we can figure out your parental lock. There's ways around these things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and of course we have the famous statement of uh, Imam Zayn al-Abideen, who said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden three things and three things. The point of this is never underestimate any act of obedience to Allah. Don't think by lowering my gaze, who cares? What does Allah care? What does anyone care? Never underestimate an act of obedience or disobedience to Allah. Because Allah, uh, 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 Zayn al Abidin, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed three things and three things. He concealed his, uh, his good pleasure and acts of obedience to him. You don't know which act 
contains the ridwan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know which one it is. If you knew, then that's the one you would do all the time. Like the man, from the story from the salaf, the man who was, going, who was dying, his sons were next to him, and he said, when I'm dead, uh, incinerate my body and scatter it to the winds. And his, his son said, why do you want to do that? He said, I'm too embarrassed to, to face Allah on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And he already knew that Allah has the power to reconstruct his body, but it made him feel better. And while he was saying this, two tears rolled off the sides of his face. So his sons burned his body and scattered it on a jabal, on a mountain. On the Yom Al-Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the winds to reconstruct the body. And Allah asked him, why did you ask your sons to do that? And Allah knows best, obviously. And he said, well, I was too embarrassed to stand before you. And Allah said, didn't you, didn't you know I already forgave you? For what? He said, the two tears that rolled off your face, this was your accepted tawbah. They had already forgiven you. Right? So never underestimate any act of obedience or disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the other part says, and Allah has concealed his wrath and acts of disobedience to him. It might be something small, a little white lie. I made fun of this person. I made a little ghibah. Who cares? It's nobody knows. You never know about the, the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, so then, فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُ Or, running out of time. Should I stop now, or maybe five more minutes? Okay. So here we go quickly. Uh, as for the one whose mawazin have been found to be heavy. And mawazin is either a plural of mizan, which, are, which is a scale, ism ala, a noun of instrument, or is in the plural of mawzun. Mawzun is the passive participle. Mawzun means something to be weighed. Something to be weighed. Qadi Abu Bakr bin Arabi, he said, there's no sound hadith about literal scales on the Day of Judgment. There's no sound hadith. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says mawazinu, he's talking about a'mal. He's just talking about deeds. Deeds, right? And deeds include iman and ikhlas and intentions. But when he says thakulat, that these mawazin, these a'mal, or thakila, that means they've been accepted, they're maqbul. So there's no literal scales. This is the dominant opinion. What the verse means according to the dominant opinion of Mufassirin is that whoever, whoever finds that their deeds have been accepted. Mawazinu means Literally, things that can be weighed. So these are a'mal. And thakulat, meaning they become heavy, meaning that they've been accepted. If his deeds have been accepted, what's the next verse? فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيًا He will be in a life that is happy. He will be in a happy life. And this is also majaz aqli. Because life can't be happy. How can life, something intangible will be happy, right? So in other words, he's going to be in Jannah, according to the Mufassirin. Aisha is from uh, Aisha, or, you know, the name Aisha, the ism, far'il, feminine. What does Aisha mean? It means to live free of concern of dunya. Free of, can you imagine a life free of concern? You don't have to think about food or rent or shelter, paying the gas bill, you know, going to school, getting your degree. You don't have to worry about anything. Nothing. Right? And you think, well, rich people have that. No, rich people don't have it. Rich people have more worries than poor people sometimes. Who are relatively poor people. And Aisha to Radiya, both of these nouns are indefinite. There's Tanwim. They're Nakira. And again, Nakira, in the indefinite article, according to the people of Balagha, means something that is uh, unexplainable, something that is unlimited. A life that is impossible to explain to you. There's no frame of reference for it. And then, As for those whose a'mal have been rejected, according to the ulama, this is the meaning of this. Literally it means, for those whose things to be weighed have been found light. So a'mal that are evil do not have weight. There's no weight to them. Okay. So this is the other side of the previous verse. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says mawazin, he's talking about a'mal. And when he says that their 
Khafifa, it means that they've been rejected. So this also refers to Muslims. There are things that we do, even though we have iman, that are not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have no weight because there's an ulterior motive. We're doing things possibly with riyah, ostentation, to show off in religious matters. This is a major, major issue, especially for the ulama. The ulama write books for themselves, how to deal with riyah. Five volume book for himself. He's a scholar, he's going to read it himself. Because scholars have this major issue. And so do the lay people, obviously, as well. Right? In other words, to do things to please humanity, to find a place in the heart of the creation, rather than finding a place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what's the result of that? For ummuhu hawiyah. Ummuhu, this means his mother. His mother is hawiyah. So hawa means to fall down, to fall or to tumble. Like it says, one najm ida hawa, right at the beginning of Surah Najm, the star when it goes down. Hawiya, according to, I haven't used my board. We won't use it tonight. Hawiya <laughs> uh, literally means an abyss or a chasm between two mountains. Imagine two mountains in the middle. That chasm is called Al Hawiya, right? And being in Al Hawiya is. Hell on earth. There's a man who fell into a hawiya. He was there for 127 hours. A true story. In Utah. He had to cut off his own arm. Amputate his own arm. With a, with a blunt knife. Right? And the things he experienced as far as hallucinations. And what he had to drink and eat. And things like that. Right? So being in that area. Of, you know. Especially if you're claustrophobic. So it says... His mother is this chasm. So there's an expression in Arabic that says Hawat Ummuhu. Hawat Ummuhu means, like for example, if somebody is walking around and they're kind of grumpy or sad, you say it is as if his mother has fallen into a chasm. Right? So this is an idiom in Arabic. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using an idiom in the language of the Quraysh. So his mother is an abyss. His mother is what? What is your mother? The Arabs love their mothers. Of course, we should all love our mothers. Your mother is your refuge. Right? Your mother is your masir, where you go to. Even grown men. Grown men, when they're in battle and they're going to die, they say, mommy, mother. They think about their mothers. This is a fact. Even if their mother's long past. Right? Because your mother is the one who loves you unconditionally. The purest type of love between human beings is the love of a mother for her children and vice versa. That's the purest type of love on earth between human beings. Right? So his refuge, uh, his refuge is al hawiyah Because you run to your mother in sadness and she embraces you, the hawiyah will embrace this person when he falls into it. Um, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve us from that. Now we have the same type of... So again, we have the sort of circular chiasmus in the surah. The beginning and the end sort of mirror one another. We have the same type of thing at the beginning. But now, And what can possibly explain to you what is it? Meaning the hawiya. And here the pronoun is used. What is it? Narun hamiya. Nar is fire, and hamia from hamia, the verb is an adjective meaning blazing, blazing, white hot fire. If you just say nar, fire is hot, but hamia gives it that, uh, that added emphasis, blazing, blazing hot fire. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al wa So we're done with the quick. Just see you in the